the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So today, celebrating the beheading of St. John the Baptist. Uh, the color is red, so uh, martyr for Christ, martyr for the truth, um, in that he was put to death because of his witness for the sanctity of marriage, telling Herod it was not lawful for him to divorce his wife and take unto himself Herodias, the wife of his brother. Uh, so the, the witness of John the Baptist uh, given today with, with his life. Now, it, interesting to note that with among the other saints, um, their principal feast day is the day of their death, the day that they were martyred or, or passed on to their heavenly reward, whatever it may be. Uh, but for St. John the Baptist, the pr principal feast day is his birth, which is June 24th. And today, the beheading of John the Baptist is only a third-class feast day. And this would be in keeping with our Lord's words, uh, there is not a, a, a man born of woman greater than John the Baptist. So, okay, that's what our Lord says. We're going to celebrate that birth. Which is also, of course, theologically, um, or philosophically, whatever you want to say, a, a proper, since the Church celebrates the entrance into a sinless life, and therefore other saints, it is their death, the day of their death, which is their principal feast day, and their birth isn't even, I mean, who even knows, right? Maybe you mentioned it as an historical note, but it's, it's going to be the day of their death or something uh, close to that or like that that is going to be their principal feast day, otherwise with St. John the Baptist. Uh, but today is by no means an insignificant uh, feast. It used to be, a, I think, a double major, uh, but it's a third-class feast nowadays. Uh, but we would want to, um, actually, St. Ambrose uh, has quite the entry on St. John the Baptist today, and we will hear his uh, words uh, towards the end. Uh, but just to remind ourselves of the story, it's always good to, to recall it. Uh, this is recounted in uh, Matthew and Mark. Uh, the Gospels of Matthew and Mark is recounted the story, and in Luke 9 mentions it, but doesn't quite go into all the details. So the gospel for today is taken from Mark 6, and it is simply that. Uh, at that time, Herod sent and apprehended John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, the wife of Philip, his brother, because he had married her, or as we say, attempted to marry her. For John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Now Herodias, the evil, wicked uh, woman, uh, was laid snares for him and was desirous to put him to death but could not. For Herod feared John, knowing him to be a just and holy man, and kept him. And when he heard him, did many things, and heard him willingly. So Herod, we could say, perhaps is on the verge, verge of a conversion, right? He sees him to be a good man, a holy man, speaking the truth, and is willing to listen to it. But the evil, wicked Herodias uh, just simply wants him to be dead. And here's the wickedness of evil. This is why you can never tolerate evil, because evil will never tolerate good. When, when you only tolerate evil insofar as getting rid of it would be worse than tolerating it. But you cannot tolerate evil in principle. Because just as we're seeing today in these evil, wicked times, uh, once evil gets the upper hand, they are not tolerant of anybody else. Does not matter. Uh, free speech, my body, my choice, out the window. We're seeing it. Forced vaccines, the complete lawlessness in the cities. Uh, and so we're seeing that, that the, the wicked, those who are evil and they want to be evil, they hate the righteous. And if they got the opportunity, they would put them to death. And so we see that with Herodias. Evil, she wants to be evil, and it's not enough that, that St. John did nothing. All he said was, you cannot have her. He said that to Herod, you can't have her. This is not lawful. It's not right. You can't do this. Herod did it anyways. Herodias got her way, but it wasn't enough. She was vindictive and petty and spiteful. And that is what evil is. Evil cannot stand the censure of the, of, the, of the righteous. So, uh, when a convenient day was come, Herod made a supper for his birthday, for the tri princes and tribunes and chief men of Galilee. And when the daughter of the same Herodias had come in, so this would be Herod's stepdaughter, I suppose, and danced, a wicked lascivious dance, uh, that pleased Herod and them that were at table with him. The king said to the damsel, Ask of me what thou wilt, and I will give it to thee. And he swore to her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask, I will give thee, even though it be half my kingdom. Who, when she, and now that's a rash, stupid, foolish oath that he gave when he was half drunk himself. Um, who, when she was gone out, said to her mother, What shall I ask? But she said, The head of John the Baptist. Here we go. Got my chance to get my revenge. 
And when uh, the daughter uh, was come in immediately with haste, said to the king, I will, thou will give me the head uh, di in a dish, the head of John the Baptist. And the king was struck, uh, but yet because of his oath and because of them that were at table with him, he would not displease her, but sending an executioner, commanded that his head should be brought on a dish. And he beheaded him in the prison and brought his head in on a platter and gave it to the damsel, and she gave it to her mother, which when his disciples hearing came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Uh, thus the account of the beheading of John the Baptist. Now, the, the first thing that I would like to point out um, in this is that uh, in, 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 in all this, we think, oh, Herod was bound by his oath, and he didn't really want to, but it did anyways. Um, Herod was an idiot. Everybody there was an idiot because they didn't know the true value of sanctity. In that St. John the Baptist's head was worth more than half of Herod's kingdom. It was worth more than all of Herod's kingdom. And nobody pointed that out because nobody knew how properly to value sanctity because they were all worldly minded. Uh, but that is the first lesson we should take away is, is that when you, when you steep yourself in vice and lust and evil and so on, you don't value uh, sanctity. You don't even value what is good because you love what is evil, right? Where your treasure is, there your heart is. And you can say it the other way around too, is it uh, where your heart is, that's what your treasure is. And so if your heart is in sanctity, you value it. If your heart is in the things of this world, if your heart is in evil and pleasures, you value it. And you'll be willing to trade sanctity for it. And so we see that right there with, with, with Herod. If, if he had just been more careful and thought, wait a minute, what is the value of John the Baptist's head? It's worth more. He, he would have been able to say, no, I'm fulfilling my oath. I only said up to half my kingdom, not more. I'm sorry, you have to make a different request. That's what he should have done. Uh, but that's why, that's part of why, um, which we'll see at the end, uh, St. Ambrose d delivers his uh, scathing criticism of Herod and Herodias uh, on this account, which is just, um, I'll, I'll read it at the end, but it truly is um, an example of what ought, what ought to be said by those in positions of authority, by the bishops, by those responsible for upholding good. Is it in the face, uh, 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 in the example of wickedness, we ought to condemn them? And if you look at this, like, okay, look, Herod, Herodias, maybe they loved each other. Maybe uh, she was in a horrible marriage with, with Philip, Herod's brother. Maybe it was better where she was. Uh, you know, the, church, the laws of the church are hard. Why should people be held to these standards? Now, we'll see what St. Ambrose has to say about that. But I would like to actually continue here with the uh, continuing. What happened to St. John the Baptist after that? His disciples came and buried his body. Where? Uh, well, they buried it in Sebast. Or I don't know how to pronounce that, but it's in the West Bank now, of um, right there by Jerusalem. Uh, so it was buried somewhere in that area, and later interred in a church. Now this church was destroyed during the reign of Julian the Apostate around the fourth century, and so the the body, the bones of of Saint John, some of which it says were burnt in the fire uh, in the destruction of the church, were taken to various other places to be rescued, and are are now in various churches all over the world. And there are many, many, many churches. Uh, Orthodox, um, you know, Latin Rite, whatever, that claim to have uh, relics of St. John the Baptist. Uh, but w even more controversy surrounds the head of John the Baptist, which uh, was thrown by Herodias into a dung heap, which we are told from tradition, and where it is rescued by Joanna, the wife of one of Herod's servants. And I didn't know this, but Joanna is mentioned in the Gospels. Um, it's from actually Luke chapter 8, is where we hear who she was. Uh, it's Luke chapter 8, verse 2. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many, many others who provided for him Jesus from their substance. So uh, just read it many times, but just never, never stuck. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. So tradition tells us she was the one who rescued the head of John the Baptist from the dung heap where it was thrown by Herodias. And it was, uh, I don't know what happened to it. I, I didn't really have enough time to research tons of, of contradictory stories. Uh, but um, nowadays, um, it was like discovered f the first time and then lost again and discovered a second time and then lost again and discovered a third time. And as of now, there are like five or six churches claim to have the head of John the Baptist. 
including some Muslims. Uh, Islam, Islamic religion actually venerates John the Baptist and claims to have relics or part of it, whatever it may be. Uh, now, the, the truth, I think there's two, at least two, and maybe, maybe a, little, a few more legitimate claims to having John the Baptist's head. And what it is, is they have part of his head. Uh, I think one place has a, f- a fragment of his jawbone, and they constructed a skull around it, like a plaster skull. It, okay, it's more impressive. The head of John the Baptist, all right, we get it. Part of his head, jawbone, pieces of the skull, whatever it may be. Uh, so that is um, uh, likely the case. So when you hear, oh, yeah, there's two heads of John the Baptist, no, there, there, there's parts of it that they just reconstructed a whole skull around. Uh, but, I, but no no one single place has all of it. It's not like it's, it's not all in one piece. Uh, same thing you two hear, too, uh, about on that note, just like with the um, uh, splinters, relics of the true cross. Oh, if you gathered all the relics of the true cross together, you could build a cathedral. Um, I, I don't know. That's, you look at those, they're splinters, absolute splinters. Uh, so this, this is um, specious attacks against the relics of the church. Uh, so there's a little more about what happened to St. John the Baptist's uh, body and, and head after uh, death. Um, but I would like to, to, to pay more attention to the, the, the manner of the death. And um, St. Ambrose, is, as I mentioned, is uh, absolutely scathing criticism. Uh, for, you know, you have this defense of wickedness and this, this kind of uh, weak, weak um, need response of like, oh, well, you know, like I said, it's hard to uphold it. And maybe they're not such bad people after all. And, you know, we can understand this. And they, they, they killed John the Baptist. They killed an innocent man because he disagreed with them, because he was standing up for the truth, right? Murderers. That's what you call that. Um, and it's, it's no different today. When you have people being put out of business, you have people being uh, the cancel culture. They're being canceled because they're, they're standing up to evil. That's what you call a bully. And the only reason there's not more bloodshed in the streets is because the civil order, as of now, won't allow it. But that isn't going to last for long, I tell you that. Um, so what ought we to do? It's because evil is not condemned. And this is an error that started around the time of Vatican II, which is a mistaken notion on the part of John the Twenty Third, and I mean I, I believe he was sincere, but he says that the church will no longer condemn, but only approve. The church will only applaud when wicked men do goodness and teach that which is good and promote that which is good, and we'll just kind of ignore all those things that are bad. No more fulminating anathemas and so on and so forth. Well, the minute you let a, you let off of uh, a criticism, the minute you let off condemning evil. Guess what happens? It only took 60 years, and we were in a cesspool of filth in the world today. Why? Because the Catholic Church, and the Catholic bishops, and the Catholic priests are not condemning that which is evil. It must be condemned. And how? How are we to do that? If you were going to condemn Herod and Herodias for their behavior today, how would you do it? Um, um, for, for beheading John the Baptist? I will read you how we're supposed to do it, and it's from St. Ambrose. And this is from the Matins readings, the second Nocturne of the Matins readings, and this is absolutely brilliant, his uh, rhetoric at its best, and, and this is the fruit of meditation upon uh, uh, virtue and goodness and, and a proper valuation of it. So here we go, St. Ambrose. Uh, we must not hurry by the record of Blessed Baptist John. We must ask what he was, by whom, and why, and how, and when he was slain. He was a righteous man murdered by adulterers. The guilty passed upon their judge the sentence of death. Moreover, the death of the prophet was the fee of a dancing girl. And lastly, there was a feature about it from which even savages shrink. The order for completing the atrocity was given amid the merriment of a dinner party. From banquet to prison, from prison to banquet, that was the course run by the servants of the murderer. How many horrors does this simple crime embrace within its details? Who is there that, upon seeing the messenger hasten from the dinner table to the prison, would not have forthwith concluded that he carried an order for the prophet's release? It was Herod's birthday. He was giving a great feast. What have executions in common with dinners? What has death in common with gaiety? And yet, while the banquet was going on, the prophet was hurried to death by an order from the reveler whom he had not troubled even by a prayer for release. He was slain with a sword, and his head was served up in a plate. This was the new dish demanded by a cruelty which the feast had been powerless to glut. Look, savage king, look at a decoration which suits well thy banquet. 
Put out thine hand, so as to lose no part of the luxury of cruelty, and let the streams of the sacred blood run between thy fingers. Thine hunger and dinner hath been unable to satisfy. Thy cups have not been able to quench thine inhuman thirst. Suck, suck the blood which the still palpitating veins are discharging from the severed neck. Look at the eyes. Even in death they remain the eyes of a witness of thine uncleanness. But they are closing themselves now upon the spectacle of thy pleasures. Indeed, those eyes are shutting, but it seems not so much from the laws of natural death as from the horror at the scene of thine enjoyment. The golden mouth, whose bloodless lips are silent now, can repeat no more the denunciation which thou couldst not bear to hear, and still thou art afraid of it. Thus St. Ambrose. Would to God we had bishops willing to deliver such condemnation. Would to God we had bishops able to deliver such condemnations. We've heard several, uh, and they're, they're out there, Bishop uh, Schneider, uh, Bishop Vigano, perhaps they're capable, perhaps they're willing, uh, but th they don't even come close to this kind of, 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 of excellent rhetoric, uh, of, of exposing the horror, the evil, the filth of those who do wrong. I would pray for them for courage, and I would pray that other bishops see that that's their job. And it seems like, like those, those, those bishops I've mentioned, they seem like they're going above and beyond. They're doing their duty. That's what the bishops are supposed to do, is not just preach what is good, but condemn what is evil. And you see what's happening when it's not condemned. Nobody knows what to do in the face of it. You see cops and mayors and governors uh, completely unable to punish absolute criminals, helpless against the face of mobs and rioters. People are being killed in the streets, beaten to a pulp, and they do nothing. Cowards. Absolute cowardice. And what are those governors doing? What are those police chiefs doing? Uh, they're following the example of the bishops. Cowards. It's about time we stood up and did something. Condemn those people and those actions for what they are. This is not about racism. This is not about injustice. This is about Satan attempting to control the world. That's what it's always been about. These actions have to be condemned. And it's the bishop's job to establish the moral uh, standard for the world. And what are we seeing? We're seeing the woke culture establish the standard of morality for the world. And it is an evil, sickening morality indeed. We're going to see more of it. Uh, who knows? Right? There's going to be only those priests, only those bishops left uh, who are willing to keep the faith, who are willing to die for it, and maybe then, finally, uh, uh, before their deaths, will have some uh, uh, proper um, uh, d denunciation, condemnations, uh, and then others will follow suit. That's always how it works. I would say that uh, I wanted to note uh, in this very same gospel, uh, chapters, what happens immediately after the death of John the Baptist? Christ's account of the multiplication of the loaves for the 5,000. That is always what the death of a righteous man does. It multiplies, multiplies. And, and the blood of the martyrs is the seeds of the faith. We know this. So let us not be afraid uh, to stand up and, and be uh, martyrs, uh, whether that is white martyrdom or red martyrdom, sacrifice of our life or our goods and property, whatever it may be. Let us follow the example of John the Baptist. Uh, there was not a man born of woman greater than he. And so it seems that, uh, barring from Christ, all right, up to the time of Christ, uh, we have no better example. Follow the footsteps of Christ. Follow the footsteps of John the Baptist. Uh, fear not, but only believe. St. John the Baptist, pray for us. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.